Well, good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from Michigan, where we're experiencing what seems to be a balmy winter's day here. Welcome to Smart Solutions, expanding the L&D playbook. My name is Tom Petro. I'm the Business Development Director at Innovative Learning Group, and I will be moderating today's session. Um, as some context for today, just a brief overview of Innovative Learning Group for those of you who don't know us. ILG is a performance first learning company. We've been in business for 17 years. We were founded in 2004 by our owner and CEO, Lisa Tunigas, who's pictured here. We have more than 175 clients in 35 industries. And we're also a certified women's business enterprise, a fact that's becoming more important to many organizations as we work and they work to look to increase diversity among their suppliers and vendors. Now, as a performance first learning company, we know that not all issues can be solved with training. What's important is improving the performance of employees. And many times it's not an e-learning or a virtual instructor-led training that's needed, but instead some well-designed performance support. So today, with that in mind, Jim is going to address how L&D professionals historically have designed formal solutions that take people away from their work to learn something new by talking about smart solutions that invert your thinking from off the job to on the job. All right, let's take a look at our presenter, Mr. Jim Naughton. It's my pleasure to introduce Jim. He's the uh, ILG senior consultant. He's uh, been a longtime colleague of mine with uh, 40 years of experience in organizational performance and talent management. He's worked across all aspects of the learning and development spectrum, and he's an expert in higher level solutions like curriculum architecture, learning strategy, technologies for learning delivery, and impact evaluation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Well, thanks very much, Tom. What a wonderful introduction. Today's agenda is going to be uh, pretty full, pretty, uh, pretty exciting for, for us to, uh, to share. In today's webinar, I, I want to share some ideas that I think will make each of us a star in our own, own organization, because the secret is to figure out smart solutions for people to learn while they work. I'll offer some changes we can make in our playbook to make it possible to deliver more resources that people use on the job to make them more effective and productive. Now more than ever, we have a tremendous opportunity to support the next generation of talent. The evolution will take us from a wholly traditional training model to one that includes a portfolio that supports the learning journey over time. To get there, we need to talk about the world beyond the LMS and how other learning technologies will play a big role in making the shift. So let's, let's start off by taking stock of our current value, right? Some might say our traditional training approach looks a bit like a long walk through the desert. We build curriculums that take people away from their work in order to learn something. We force people to stop working so they can focus their attention on our training. We essentially deprive the business of water to allow training to take place. You could say the learning function has a thirst, pun intended, for producing more and more of the same traditional training. There's always so much more that people need to learn, and that results in even more time away from the productive oasis of work. So what are we talking about here? Our historical traditional training. Uh, historically, we measure the size of our achievement by the number of hours of training we provide. If you subscribe to the ATD State of the Industry Report, something that I recommend uh, people do, each year the average time in training varies a bit from the previous year, but it's generally somewhere around 40 hours, let's say, right? Your own organization, it's probably slightly above or below this, but if you operate like most L&D functions, your wish list includes lots of training topics that you would like to add. Provide more, that's the target, because 
again, there's so much more to learn out there. But what do our business leaders say? Is that what they want? How many hours of training should the average learner complete in a given year? Do they want more of their time spent away from work? No, they naturally want to see people with more time to spend with customers, building products, or implementing more effective and efficient technologies to produce productivity. They know that time on the job is vitally important to create value, drive revenue, and achieve goals. All right, so how do you respond when the business asks for shorter training? So either um, as the recipient of that question or as the um, uh, uh, person asking the question, what, uh, what usually is the result of that conversation? Go ahead and throw something out there in chat, if you will. Uh, what, what happens if, um, if we're looking for shorter training? Um, what uh, what is typically the response we hear back or we give back to um, to the question? So let me see what uh, what do we have out here in in chat land? All right, fantastic. I'm not sure everybody can see the chat, so I'll just uh, share. Right, so some people go to the um, uh, micro learning. Uh, opportunity, right? We we shorten it up and offer to make uh, make the the micro kind of um, uh, pieces that that people can consume quickly. Um, we could look at evaluating the curriculum and and sharpening our saw, and maybe maybe uh, if we whittle it down to the true training needs uh, and performance needs, we can actually cut some of the time. So. There's lots of ways to do, but we don't want to sacrifice, right? That's a good comment. Thank you. We don't want to sacrifice um, the ultimate goal and, and then result that we're trying to get. So it's important for us to um, make sure that we're not just, uh, you know, shortening things up for the sake of shortening things up because we're asked to, right? We want to do that in a smart way if we need to. So thank you, thank you for those chats. There we go. So I I would say let's try to change the conversation with with people if we could because lurking behind the question, can you make it shorter, is the real question. How can we get better performance? The longer version of the question is how can we get better performance without taking my resource out of the value creation stream? So what I refer to as smart solutions can be described as a way to generate more performance during the workflow. This reminds me of the e-performance webinar that my colleague Susan Fisher has offered in the past few years. I love that webinar. It really rings, uh, rings uh, long and loud. Her work was, has been influenced by the uh, Mosher and Gadfordson moments of need model. And, you know, as I listen to that back, uh, back when she has done it, and when I look at the, the model, the moments of need model itself, one of the moments that we often overlook is the need for learning while on the job. If you step back and think about it, this moment offers the ultimate win-win. We need to break through our so-called cult of training, where we automatically focus on taking somebody away from their job to learn something new. Consider this, when, when presented with a learning need, our first thought usually is, how am I going to deliver this to the learner? Should it be classroom or e-learning or virtual or something else? But I would submit that this is really not the right question to tackle first. What you should ask first is when the learner can make best use of the information. Should they learn it before they attempt the task or um, during the task, or maybe even after they've tried to perform the task on their own? The big question, in my opinion, is when. 
So let's be clear. How to safely detonate a nuclear device is something we should learn before we attempt the task. With other tasks, however, the answer can be a little bit more open for discussion. So let me share an example, right? And um, this happened a few years ago um, with, with me. I was asked to make sure that the implementation of a new travel and expense reporting app got adopted without a hitch. Of course, travel, right? Uh, that's not so common today as it has been in previous years. Uh, maybe it will be again one day. We certainly hope so. But, uh, but at that moment in time, it was a travel app that we we're implementing. And in that case, it was being implemented with thousands, in fact, you know, several thousand people across several countries um, were about to begin using this mobile app to capture expenses, submit expense reports, and basically cut out paper, right? The potential time savings for this large global manufacturer I was working with was massive but only if it was used properly. A technology implementation with large numbers of people, oh, what do you think? Classroom or e-learning? Yeah, <laughs> you're right, you got me. That's the wrong question. Before, during, or after, that's the question. In this case, the answer we, we provided was during. Learners were given a library of three-minute videos demonstrating specific tasks, such as uploading a receipt in the app. There was good interview, user interface design and you know video demos. The end result was an extremely positive ROI. A mandatory e-learning program out in front of that would have taken a big chunk out of that ROI. So to get a higher return, like any good performance consultant knows, you need to have good understanding of your target audience. And in this case, the audience we knew we had uh, was one that worked pretty well with technology. So we weren't, we weren't pitching this to, to, to people who had never used a smartphone app before. Um, with a different demographic, uh, you might've come up with a different answer, right? So let me just give you a, a quick window to the app itself. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not promoting this app. I'm just giving you some background so you, you can understand the context, right? This was the SAP Concur app. Um, and you know, I did some quick screen prints so you could see what, the, what some of the videos were look, look like, right? And, and they showed you how you could take an Uber to a conference you were going to. Remember when we used to do that? Um, but uh, you know, the Uber being an app, uh, that uh, that information was something that uh, you were able to upload directly to your travel app. And then the videos, some of them showed the Uber receipt being added, and you could see how you could, um, once connected, add it to an expense list that you were building with other charges and expenses. For example, if you went out to dinner with, with a client or guest, you could take a picture of the receipt and upload it to your, your app, right? Instead of handling paper-based receipts, it's a lot faster. So then when you got back to the office, the video, a, a different video, obviously, you know, showed how you could build that expense report, finish it off, and add any additional items that you might need to add. So the videos show you exactly what to do. Every click, step by step, although many people were able to complete the task simply by following the intuitive interface on the screen. So the videos were used as support for those who needed the guidance while they were putting together their first expense report. There's no LMS to navigate to get to the videos and no need to track completion of the content. The metric we we're looking at was successful completion of travel and expenses. And we're saving people a ton of time in, in the processing, both on the front end, those who are processing, those who are submitting travel expenses, but also on the back end in terms of, you know, how to handle it and get them paid. 
so let's take it uh, take it away from, back from that example to a couple of other instances that you might might think about. Um, you know, different possibilities here. Let's give it give it a try yourself. I, I've got three tasks on the screen. Now, which of these three tasks would would you try to use learning in the workflow? Go ahead and type your answer in chat. Do you think it's bear hunting, downhill skiing, or cappuccino making? Choose carefully. <laughs> I see a lot of coffee drinkers out there. All right. Oh, there you go. Yeah, uh, there's always got to be at least one going for the downhill skiing. All right. So very good. Very good. Yep. Yep. Keep them coming. I like it mostly for the copy, but, uh, you know, a few other responses thrown in there just to keep me on my toes. Well, so let me tell you, I, I think it's safe to say that bear hunting is something that you want to brush up on before you go out in the woods. Um, from the picture, it might look like I learned that the hard way, but no, that's, you know, that's just a picture of a stuffed bear. Uh, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really engage in that, uh, um, you know, in the workflow. So um, the second one for, for many and myself included, actually, downhill skiing was something I learned while wearing my first pair of rented skis. I, I do recommend the green run for those who are just starting out. Uh, again, something again, I, I, I did actually learn the hard way. <laughs> so, um, but um, it, it is possible, right? It is possible to learn how to ski uh, without any pre-preparation or learning. Um, I was pretty bruised that day, but, but, I, but I still ski. Okay, so enough about me. The, the third one is the safest task, obviously, to learn in the moment is making that cup of cappuccino. Um, that's, that's not a personal skill of, of, of my own, so I'm gonna take it from, uh, take the word of the group, right, who, who suggested this was the one. Um, sure, and you know, some people will want to attend a seminar from one of the great cappuccino makers of the world before they try this themselves, but for most people, I think we would skip directly to learning as you do it. As I think about all the things we must train people to do in the workplace, I would categorize them as either one, bear hunting, definitely teach them first, two, skiing, a little risky, but worth a shot at learning in the moment if you're daring enough, and three, cappuccino time. Definitely don't waste your time studying this away from the cappuccino machine. All right. So let's uh, take a look at um, uh, what smart solutions look like and how they're different. To make a smart solution that works in the moment of need during the task, we need to consider the work environment as a very different learning environment from previous conditions. After all, we're talking about learning while we work, not learning away from the job. So there's noise, interruptions, other real-time factors while doing the tasks that aren't present when we think of someone learning. A um, friend of mine I was talking to recently was saying, hey, this, this might be a good idea for, uh, for teaching people what they need to do in, in the operating room in a hospital. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely the, what we're talking about here. There's lots, lots of things to consider about that particular environment. Um, that you would want to design for, right? And we need to make smart solutions so they fit that moment of need. Typically, that means it needs to be short, very targeted, break it down into discrete subtasks or chunks. For cappuccino, perhaps the learner needs a quick review of which cups to use or what settings to apply to the coffee maker. Um, let the learner select a single focus task that they can select that they need from a library of topics. This is different from how we traditionally think about a lesson or a module of training that may take the learner through a series of related tasks. A 10 to 15 minute module is often much longer than the learner wants to spend when they're actually engaged in the task. 
it can use any combination of media that will best fit the work environment. I don't want to limit this to what we would need to, to be able to use to publish something in a SCORM format on an LMS. We want to think broader than that, right? So interactive documents that you can link to, video that, that you can use with or without audio, um, screen simulations, any, there are a lot of different things and we'll get, we'll get further into that as we go through the webinar. All these can be indexed and delivered on demand. So what's really different from traditional learning here? Well, so typically when we design for a learning environment that teaches someone before they attempt a task, we assume little or no prior knowledge on the learner's part. And given that, we start from the beginning and we teach people each step till the end of the task in sequence. In contrast, when we design for learning when the task is being performed in that moment, we should assume that the learner may already know some of what's already needed to perform the task. And they wanna dial in to exactly the one thing or a couple things that they need in that moment. So give people a chance to, to quickly identify what they need and move forward. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper on some of the differences between training and smart solutions. To make the distinction perfectly clear, smart solutions are primarily a resource, which is not the same as training. In today's information rich world, it's usually helpful to be able to quickly find information. Reliance on memory of countless facts and details is beyond the capacity of most people. Gosh, I can't remember what I did yesterday. So we try to overcome this by providing ample practice during training. That's one approach and that helps, right? That's effective up to a certain point until we breach that capacity for memory. When we cross that threshold, the result becomes inconsistent performance. And this is where we have often failed to recognize the limitations of our traditional training model. In some cases, no matter how long we keep new hires locked in a training room, they still aren't able to deliver consistently when faced with so many possible scenarios on the job. When you design a resource, you wanna focus it on information that users can access in any order. The user does not need to complete the entire sequence of items like they would in training. So tracking completion through an LMS is not an important, or not as important, I would say, say is, is knowing whether a resource is simply getting used. We wanna know it's meeting the needs of the people as they work. If it's not getting used, then obviously it wouldn't be meeting people's needs, right? So one other way of looking at solutions like this is to put it in the context of an overall curriculum, right? To put it on your curriculum plan or path, your learning path. I like to think of smart solutions as a natural evolution of the blended learning approach. Usually we stop after considering the formal training options and adding resources after the formal training is completed creates a higher level of effectiveness beyond initial knowledge and skill building. So adding resources can actually help you reduce the amount of time you spend in formal settings because you can rely on the information provided on the job to support the learner. In the earlier example with travel and expense, we found we could completely eliminate the formal training. In most other cases, you'll find that initial formal training is still needed may require less time because you've built in some supporting resources. Now let me pause here because uh, gosh, I've, I've covered a lot to, to this point. We've got a lot still to cover, but uh, I wanna check in real quick. Tom, you know, are there any general questions or things that have popped up that, that I've missed in chat uh, while I've been talking uh, nonstop here? Well, Jim, um, here's one. Are smart solutions the same as micro learning? Are they just short bits of training? Ah, that's that's really a good question, right? Because micro learning is short. 
right? Same, same concept, right, as we're talking about with a smart solution. So the, the length of a, a, a smart solution is very much in common with micro learning. What I would say, there is a key difference in, in terms of how I think about the two things um, and why I didn't, didn't call this webinar how to create great micro learning, right? The difference is how smart solutions will be consumed while doing a task. It's not simply a short burst of training content. It's got to be designed so the person can continue working without setting aside the thing that it, they are trying to do. So also, I think sometimes in micro learning, we, we're, we're using a lot of the same concepts we've, we've adopted in traditional training. I think, you know, the quicker we set some of those uh, things aside, the, the more clearly we can focus on designing for that moment of need. But yeah, they are similar. So thanks for the question. Thank you, Jim. All right. Well, keep me honest and keep the questions coming, right? We'll, uh, we'll have another opportunity at the end of the webinar for you to ask some, some other questions, things that are on your mind, um, and um, would like, like to make it uh, something that's as meaningful as possible for every one of us attending today. So thank you. All right, so what's another word for resource? Um, so when we're talking about smart solutions, there might be other things besides micro learning that we could use or say, or to, you know, use as words to describe what we're talking about. So for example, uh, from the early beginnings of performance and instruction, we've talked about job aids, right? Back in, back in the original day, right? Job aids was just a term describing a printed document that maybe you'd put up on a cork board somewhere in your office. But, uh, but job aids still in paper and printed documents, that's, that's still a smart solution or could be, right? Given, given the, uh, the work environment or electronic performance support. That, that term's been around for a long time. And that's, that's a smart solution that's designed for the moment of need on the job. So, but, you know, in addition to those, you know, maybe um, uh, older concepts that have been around for a while, you know, more recently, we've expanded the playbook to things like the virtual assistant. The virtual assistants are, are simply smart tools to have and you can use them on the job as a resource. Yeah, sure, like like Alexa or Siri, right? But uh, but you can actually adapt those things to to become more job specific and not just sort of uh, um, consumer devices. So what else? Uh, what about a what about a chatbot, right? So chatbots are AI driven, right? Uh, often with text instead of voice. But um, so similar to virtual assistants in that um, they're pre-programmed answers to things that you might ask or want information about. So they automate the responses you're likely to need at um, a particular moment in the process. But we can expand our playbook um, smart solutions to support performance to a, a number of things. We can create simulations of, of the work. Um, we can create short videos that we put out there for people to, to consume. Um, and, you know, sometimes those videos can be extraordinarily short, right? To focus in on a single task. But just like we think of training in the traditional sense, as having a number of different delivery options like classroom, e-learning, and virtual, Let's think of smart solutions as having a broad number of options as well. Okay, so uh, let me let me see what uh, what you guys are thinking about here on the webinar. What what learner groups in your organization might benefit from smart solutions to either replace or just supplement the training that that you do? So, go ahead and. Uh, throw it out there in chat. Um, let's think about the uh, groups in our organization, parts of our organization that 
um, we might consider. Uh, so engineering, yes, thank you. Thank you for, for that comment. Uh, lots of different potential, oh, finance, operators at plants, people working in the field, uh, teams that can't leave the workplace for a significant time. Yes, I know, right? Uh, there are there are people who are chained to their work, right? Their workplace, right? And they're they're not they're not allowed to wander. So um, not everybody has the luxury of sort of being able to get off the job or, or be away from the job uh, to uh, to go do uh, some learning. So lots of opportunities. Thank you. Thank you for those suggestions. So could be sales, could be customer service, could be, uh, you know, uh, nurses in an OR room, could be uh, all sorts of different uh, um, parts of the organization that could be supported by this. So how are we going to do it, right? If, if it's an interesting idea and there's interest in it, how, how are we going to go forward, right? What are the skills for our new playbook? And the first one I wanted to highlight here is analytic skills. So once you've made the decision to go forward with this, you want to be able to deliver it when your stakeholders are ready to move forward. So the, the first skill that you'd be looking for is more than just an ISD, like instructional design, content analysis routine or approach. We want to be prepared to initiate effective surveys, conduct focused interviews, review data sources. We need to get a firm hold on what kind of resources will make a difference. So we want to think performance, not content, right? We want to be able to differentiate between skill versus will and focus on, on skill issues, right, obviously, and separate memory from support topics. So analytic skills are definitely on the high end of our, our wish list uh, moving forward to put this in place. Next, uh, next on, on the list in my mind is business acumen, right? And by this, I'm not talking so much about financial acumen. Sometimes it gets uh, overlapped or, or interwoven when we're talking about business acumen, but, but I'm really talking about business processes, right? you're gonna need people with a good understanding of how the target audience performs their work. You need to have enough familiarity with the work itself to be able to consult on ways to improve it. So it can be real helpful um, the more you know about the finance function or the sales function or the engineering or the uh, OR function, right? You want, to, uh, you want to have some acumen, you don't want to, walk into an operating room and say, hey, I've got some ideas on how you can improve. Well, un unless you have some basis in knowledge and understanding of how those, how those uh, tasks are performing and, and yeah, how people work. So <clears throat> what other skills might we need to be able to deliver smart solutions? Those, those are the top two on my list. I got a few more in the background I'll share, but but I, I want to see if uh, if um, you can think of any and share in chat. Tell me what you think people might need to be able to to have as a skill set to be able to to deliver a smart solution. What uh, what does the team think? What does what do our webinar participants think? So absolutely, consultative skills. Absolutely, you need to be able to, to consult with people. Organizational skills, absolutely, you need to understand the organization, how things fit together, how business processes connect upstream and downstream. Programming skills, another great, great suggestion. That's, that's a good one, and, and that's, that's kind of where I was, was going with this too, right? I think um, when I thought about this, you know, you're going to be able to need to produce it at the end of the day. So once you've got your business acumen and your analytic skills, you're going to need some production capabilities. And I segment this, this list out a little bit separately because 
you not only need the human skills here, you need the software skills and the technology, uh, the tech, you, you need to have the software and the technology in hand. It's not just the people, right? So um, uh, to be able to build what you design, um, that's what you're gonna need. You're gonna need some, well, not all of these, right? But, uh, but given uh, any specific uh, smart solution that you might des decide to build, you might need, you know, uh, uh, better understanding of search capabilities, user interface design, AR, that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> some of these you're going to want to build internally as part of your team so that you can, can build that uh, bench strength and knowledge base of technology. Some of these you're going to obviously view as more specialization in nature and you're going to reach out to, to others in the marketplace who can can pinch hit uh, on, on things and projects once you get the idea. Next, so now we've designed it, we've developed it, how are we gonna deliver it? So uh, one last mile, and I, I, I started the session saying we're gonna need to expand our thought process beyond the LMS, right? So. The learning management systems, something uh, honestly most people are familiar with at this point, right? Your learning management system is the hub of uh, the different traditional formal learning pieces that you put forward for the organization. The core strength here is to be able to track completion of those formal learning activities. And um, so generally it's great for predefined structured content uh, however, the, the thing with learning management systems, quite honestly, you know, most people uh, don't have this open on their desktop all day long, uh, and um, and they're not, and, and you know, they're not uh, uh, necessarily the easiest to to navigate, right? Because there's usually so many capabilities involved. It would take you several clicks to get to a specific answer, I think. So. So usually when I'm thinking about smart solutions, I'm not thinking about sharing it on an LMS, but you know, if that's all you have in your organization, I wouldn't rule it out, right? Put it out there, at least get started. Um, other technologies to consider then, um, we've also seen the learning content management systems or LCMS, that's been a technology type that's been out there for quite some time. It's a great way to catalog, repurpose, and manage pools of content. Um, and it helps your L&D team be more efficient at authoring and producing that content. But it, it really doesn't have a track record as a delivery tool, right? It's, um, it's uh, not going to be as useful as a delivery system for smart solutions, although it certainly could, could help you create them. Learning experience platforms are becoming more popular and trending as a tool for, for L&D. We've seen that in many more organizations now. Um, the strength is to curate so much content that's out there in the public marketplace now. Uh, really been an explosion of content the past several years. And, um, and a lot of times the experience platforms will be able to uh, suggest um, content that's of interest to people once they've consumed something uh, related. So if you go out looking for uh, coaching content on your learning experience platform, it, it can suggest a lot of other things that, that you might be interested in. Um, so that's, that's another option. Um, it's it's a, a bit of a wide angle tool. Um, so the next is team collaboration applications. I think a lot of a lot of companies have SharePoint sites, Google Docs, um, other things, right? That uh, that you use to promote team collaboration, and um, uh, a great way to organize and and uh, uh, you know provide access to people. A lot of times. Um, Workers uh, in the information-rich economy will will have these collaboration sites and folders open on their desktop throughout the day. So that could be um, a, a real option, right? For 
for publishing uh, additional smart solutions and resources for people. You can have embedded applications. That's uh, something that you may have seen, if, especially if you work with software. Um, a lot of times people introducing SAP or Salesforce or other big enterprise systems will put embedded tools so you can click on something as you're working on it and get uh, you know, a, a little information assist or, or drill into uh, um, what you're supposed to be doing and, and, and how to do it in, in that software. So embedded tools, great opportunity. Um, if, um, if you're able to, uh, to work with those, that's a great place to deliver smart solutions as well. Internet sites, company internet and the internet sites have become pretty popular these days. <clears throat> if you can publish uh, content on that, uh, a lot of times, again, uh, learners will, will have those open <clears throat> or know how to easily and quickly open them um, while they're working. And the last option is custom applications. So you can create a mobile app <clears throat> or a number of different custom apps uh, for for people to use uh, in the moment of need. So there's 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 a variety of options for you right there. The dilemma is getting started, right? There's a time to plan your garden, and ultimately the successful gardener gets busy with the planting. Or uh, similarly, if you're in a horse race, and they're off, right? Let's just get started. Use what you have and demonstrate some value first. That's the idea, right? You can always look for support for new technologies and delivery systems once you get uh, get get moving forward, right? But I'm, I'm hoping people get get the sense that that uh, my suggestion and recommendation here is not to get bogged down in technology options because there are so many options. Those the previous slide was just the categories, you know, the the number of different uh, specific technologies and vendor providers out there is just enormous, right? <clears throat> so um, take time, do your due diligence with technology when you're conducting strategic planning for your uh, organization, or if there's a big large scale opportunity. Uh, coming down the road and you've got a lot of lead time to to look at uh, technology options, that's a great time to do that. Um, ILG, uh, we, we get involved in uh, supporting people's technology decisions in the learning space as well. We can help you with that. But um, uh, obviously, the, the, the core idea here is start the race, right? Don't don't get too far behind. So that, uh, that's sort of uh, the idea here, right? And, and so uh, to summarize, uh, we've talked about building solutions for on-the-job access and use. Uh, we've talked about reducing or eliminating formal training by building in uh, smart solutions that are used on the job. Uh, we've talked about how to add some of the skills and capabilities to the L&D team uh, so that you can actually design, develop, and deliver. And then um, last but not least, we've, we've opened up the, um, the conversations about uh, how to work be, uh, beyond the LMS uh, to deliver those solutions once you've begun to produce them as part of your playbook. Uh, with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank you and I want to thank all of you who joined us today. As you can see, our contact information is on the screen and uh, feel free to reach out after this session at any time with questions. You can send a note to Jim or myself, or you can even go on our website and uh, put an inquiry in, however you want to do that. And then remember, uh, immediately following the webinar, you're going to receive an email with a link uh, for a short survey. And please uh, give us the feedback. We love it. It helps us obviously refine sessions like this or even come up with new ones. Um, we love the feedback. And as we said, we recorded this session. So early next week, you'll receive the YouTube link along with this slide deck. So with that, I want to thank you again for coming. And we hope to see you next time.
take care.